it's been a Herculean task and I am in awe at the faculty that I work with and the skills. It's been a really great opportunity to see our strengths being used for the benefit of the students and for the public that we serve. It's really easy to turn a blind eye. Like Michelle said, you, you didn't know your mask level. Why didn't you know it? Just because you just didn't pay attention to it. And so a lot of offices during the day-to-day -day grind, they just weren't paying attention to updates. And now all of that came raining down on them at once. And I don't know if, if maybe this is just what it's gonna take to fix it. To have the self-efficacy of being like, I need to do this for myself and my family. And if someone you're working for doesn't understand that, and if your coworkers don't understand that, in my opinion, I wouldn't want to be there. I wouldn't want to work with people who don't respect that. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists. This is your student-focused roundtable for the month. I just wanted to give a quick plug for Q Optics. Yes, they are sponsoring the show, but I also want to let, let you know how easy it was to work with them. We met with them in Chicago at one of the big conferences called Chicago Midwinter. And right there on the exhibit hall floor, they walked me through all of the necessary steps to be able to get really dialed in for a good pair of loops. Now, I've always been skeptical of loops, and my experience with Q Optics really changed my point of view on loops. So if you're thinking about it and you have the ability in the program that you're in to have Q Optics come in, make sure you guys reach out. You won't be sorry. Let's get into the student focus roundtable. So at the beginning of the student focus series that you, this was your brainchild uh, last year in 2019. Isn't that the year? Gosh, there's yeah, flying back. Yeah, it's the beginning of 2019. We're like, look, the students need a little bit more direction. We really value that. Like, we're so impressed you guys are even listening to this. Let's be it's honest. So true. Yeah. So like, let's give them something. They're, they're taking the time to listen to us. Let's give them something that they actually could use. And you came up with the idea of a round table and we brought on different people that would talk about one particular topic. And then I kind of hijacked it for 2020 and made it a little more researchy because that's what I do. But I hope that you guys find it helpful because what we're aiming to do is bring on people who understand the topic and let them explain to you how they're looking at research and applying it clinically. Because what happens is we graduate with the knowledge we graduate with, and it might be a little, uh, no, I don't want to say up to date. It might not be as up to, to date because they had to get you graduated, right? But there's stuff on like HPV and that, you know, it's ever changing. And so we got to stay on top of that. And so we're going to bring the experts on so that we can teach you how to read the research and apply it to your patient care. So you can always be doing that up to date evidence based clinical practice that we talk about so much. And we hope you enjoy this student focused episode. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. Well, I am super excited for another fantastic round table. We are kicking off the month of September because this is Dental Infection Control Awareness Month. And so it would just be the perfect round table to talk about some things that are happening in infection control and how are we getting ready to go back into these dental hygiene programs? Because this is the student focused round table. And so we, I brought two fantastic faculty members who are just true rock stars. I mean, I would have died to have you as colleagues and also teachers. And you've heard them before on the podcast. I want to welcome Emily Bogey and Jessica Atkinson. Bogey, you've heard multiple times on the podcast. Jessica was also on another fantastic round table that we had. If you didn't already hear that, just go check them out. But if you have, if this is your first podcast with these two lovely ladies, I'm going to give them the floor and let them introduce themselves. Bogey, since you have seniority on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Welcome. <laughs> thank you. I am Emily Bogey, and I am the Dental Administrative Chair at Hawkeye Community College in Waterloo, Iowa. 
and I have a dental assisting program and a dental hygiene program under my umbrella. So um, super fortunate to have awesome faculty working at our school and happy to be here. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome. Hello, hello. My name is Jessica Atkinson. And I'm assistant professor at Dixie State University in St. George, Utah. And I have been a hygiene faculty for many years at different institutions. And I am very happy to be here to speak with both of you. Oh, y'all are so fabulous. Thank you for taking the time today. And I want to just jump into it and, you know, also bring up the point that everyone's uh, programs are going to be very different across the country. And if you are listen listening internationally, but I really want to know what you two, um, well, you've been seeing students, right? This is not fall semester is not the first semester back, correct? For me, um, my students came back. So in Iowa, we obviously are in a different situation than many other areas in the country. So I only can speak to what I currently experience. Kind of want to put that caveat out there. So we were taken out of class right before St. Patrick's Day. So it's, I think it's March 16th was the exact date. And we were taken off campus. Our didactic had to go online and our clinicals and our labs were put at a screeching halt. And so what we did was rather than graduating our students in May, any class that had a lab or a clinical component, the students were given an incomplete, which in the eyes of, of the government in terms of financial aid and in the eyes of the college just means that their education was put on pause for some reason. And then once we can press play and they can complete that, then that can be as soon as it, as long as it's before a certain date, which for our date, it was mid-September that they needed to have that completed by in order to progress to the next semester. So that all being said, we had our students come back on June 15th. And so what we did was we compacted the um, clinical curriculum, meaning we had the same amount of hours in a shorter amount of time because they didn't have to have the didactic component. So instead of having clinic on like Tuesday morning, Thursday morning, we had it Tuesday all day, Thursday all day. So between the dates of um, June 15th and July the 9th, we got all of our clinical hours met for both dental assisting and dental hygiene. And so we had all of our students back on campus this summer. Everyone stayed healthy. There were a lot of rules we put in place. So that's kind of my answer in terms of mm -hmm. us being back on campus. Jessica, what's that look like for you? Are, oh, well, what we do here in Utah, because we are by some hot spots, uh, we came to a screeching halt right after spring break in spring semester. And so we haven't been back into clinic until this fall. So we went all distance learning. Gratefully, the way that our program is constructed is we have a competency-based program and we were able to show competency with our students that were graduating and they were able to graduate in May on time, on target, due to how many clinical hours they had already logged and how much of their curriculum they had already been through. And we had them set up to be preparing for their clinical boards and they were slated to take their clinical boards actually the week we got back in the spring and we all know what happened there, it didn't happen. And so we were able to get our graduating seniors taken care of, all of their requirements and clinical hours noted and graduate on time. As far as our juniors were concerned, we are now back into clinic, having done distance learning through the summer. And with our new clinic schedule, they are logging more hours to make up for what they missed in the springtime. And we are also putting them on a track to log more hours in case something happens in the spring this time or or now in the fall. So they're going to be in clinic a lot with a lot of new rules and regulations to keep them and their patients and us as faculty safe. So my experience as a student and as a faculty member has always been that the infection control standards at my school has always been top notch. I mean, we've always been on top of it. Anything that is re recommended by CDC, OSHA, like we, we do it, no questions asked. So I, I'm assuming also that you guys are having pretty, you've had pretty strict programs prior to COVID. What would you say is the biggest 
change coming back and starting to see patients um, because of COVID? I can take that one. This summer, you know, uh, and that was the interesting thing with with our department too, uh, in terms of all of health sciences. When I said I wanted to come back and I wanted to bring live patients on campus, it was like at first mm-hmm. the the administration. I, I got one of those, uh, and I'm like, okay, guys, let's step back. We have always used the highest standards of infection control. We've always been an example to those in the community of what's current, and you know our students take that out into the community. So let's step back and say, first of all, we're already in compliance. Yes, we are going to need to add some things. Yes, we are going to need to change some things, but as a whole, we're in a good place to begin with, which I, I'm not going to judge, but I'm going to say maybe not everyone in dentistry was at that point when COVID hit. Then some of the things we did to prepare our students to come back in June, the first thing I had them do was I sent out a log to take their temperature every morning and every night um, and then monitor their symptoms or respiratory symptoms every morning and every night. And I sent them the CDC symptoms that they were supposed to be looking for. So for two full weeks before they were allowed back in clinic, all the faculty, all the students and the dentists all had to do that. So that was their ticket back into clinic the first day, handing in that log. Then they had to also keep a log during clinic, the same log um, for every, you know, before they went into clinic, their temperature, after they got out of clinic, their temperature. That way we can, we could track symptoms and such. And if someone had something or an exposure, then we could step in and, and put that protocol into place. But all of the faculty and the students, everyone was super good at making sure that they were in, well, I just kept referring to it as compliance. Are you in compliance? Yes, I'm in compliance. Can I see your form? Yes, you can see my form. So we had all of that put into place and then that's going to carry over into the fall semester. The only difference is now we are not going to have it on paper form. It is going to be just digitally documented and self-reported. Um, I, I found out how much paper I truly went through with that and so we're going to switch over to a different system. But um, that was probably the, the biggest adjustment is re- having the students recognize that they had to um, test themselves at the beginning and end of every day. And that if there was a problem that they needed to come to me and we needed to talk about it, because I, that was my number one thing, keeping everyone safe. I mean, yeah, there's other things like you know, we quit using ultrasonics. We started doing selective polish rather than you know having all that polishing and slow speed action going on in the clinic. But we were already using high speed evacuations. That wasn't something we had yet. We had the PureVax. We had implemented that for over a year when this all happened. Previously, we had been wearing face shields only when we produce aerosols. Now the students wear face shields chair side all the time. Another thing, we we had never been wearing respirators. So respirators were a new thing. So we had to have a nurse come in, make sure everyone could wear the respirators and, and everyone was safe with their health uh, questionnaire off the OSHA website. Um, we had a nurse come in and, and check everybody over and she signed off and then we implemented the respirators. But what we did with the respirators is everyone was wearing them, but then you had to say, well, we couldn't really afford to <laughs> throw them <laughs> away after every patient. And so what we did was we considered the respirator as kind of part of their face. And then we did a level three mask covering over the respirator. So you'd change the level three mask between patients, but you'd you'd keep your, and and if anything happened to that respirator, if anything happened and it got contaminated, if it got dropped, if it got wet, anything, if they sneezed in it, one student had a bloody nose and I had to replace hers. Um, So just anything like that, then I would replace it. But when you're talking about, I mean, there's already a shortage of PPE. We did the best we can with what we have. And that's the one message I do want to put out there to educators is it's really hard as educators to be like, but it's not perfect. Sometimes we do the absolute best we can for patients as long as we're staying in compliance. We have the hygiene curse that if we don't get the 4.0, it's not good enough. So we just talked about OSHA before. (laughs) (laughs) If we have OSHA guidelines and we have all, you know, the recommendations from the CDC, our hygiene heart wants to be in compliance at the very highest. And I think that's been the hardest for faculties is to try and find, do the best with what we have. For example, for my university, we've had a shortage of PPE as far as getting our N95s. We have KN95s instead of having 
enough level three masks, we have to cover them with level one masks if you're doing a certain procedure and save the level threes when you're possibly producing aerosols. And so the biggest changes has been these policies and procedures and what to do when and how to do how. And I think that's been the bulk of the work that we as a faculty have gone through the summer in order to prepare our facility and our students and our faculty for these changes in implementation. The screening differences, how you're screening your patient before they come, how you're screening the patient when they get there, how you're screening yourself as Bogi discussed. And one of the biggest things for our clinic is we've gone completely digital to decrease the possibility of cross-contamination. Everything is digital. So for faculty, that's training all of these new faculty on tab. Well, they're not new faculty, but the application of their job is new. So interfacing with a tablet instead of a piece of paper and the cost to a department when you go from paper to digital and how we're allocating our funds and what that looks like for the future and we are currently under construction and it's been nuts. Mm. So our construction is going to be helpful in streamlining how we bring patients back, our sterilization room, just the little things that you don't think are going to be making a big difference do. How how things flow is going to improve our infection control. So it's been a Herculean task. And I am in awe at the faculty that I work with when the skills, it's been a really great opportunity to see our strengths being used for the benefit of the students and for the public that we serve. I mean, we could get into the conversation about what the pandemic has done to dentistry as a whole. And I think it's time for us to step up and really, really show the community and other medical professionals how we can be an integral piece of the medical dental what i want to say here is how we can really work together for the health and safety of our community i i completely agree jess um so what jessica was just saying about dental and, and acknowledging that i'm so proud of my dean and I know he'll probably never listen to this, but I'm so proud of him because he has stepped up and said to the other healthcare programs, look at dental, look at dental. They've always worn masks. They've always had like this hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. And, and when, when we put new soap dispensers in the clinic, Emily was like, no, that's not going to be okay for us. We need to have our own, you know, soap that's super effective. And he's done such a good job of being like, no, we need to pay attention here. And I'm, I'm very happy about that because, you know, he's a, he's a doctoral level nurse and being acknowledged, it just feels so good when other health professionals are like, you guys are part of the team. We need to do what you're doing. And it's like, wait a minute, you do. We've already worn, always worn masks. We've always worn gloves. Weird. We've always washed our hands like a million times. And the other thing, I, when Jess was talking, she was talking about patient screening. If anyone is listening and they have not seen the form that ADHA's task force came up with, so that good. form is so good. It's one form when the patient gets called, there's one column for the answers to the questions. When the patient comes in before they're seen, there's another column for questions. And then there's also another column for questions for at the end of the visit. And so it's very easy to pre-screen them on the phone, screen them when they walk in the building, and ask them questions and screen them before they leave. It's it's so amazing. But when we started back to clinic this summer, I had found that form. Erin Haley was on the task force and she um, had sent it to everyone in our district. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to recreate the wheel. Thank God. And so I just want to give a shout out to the brilliant minds that were on the committee. Um, I don't remember all of them offhand. I know um, Dr. Joanne Greenland was on that and Erin Haley was on that, several other folks, but Holy moly, what a good service they provided. So true. I, I'm very appreciative to everybody who kind of did it for us. <laughs> so we didn't yeah. recreate the wheel. And I'll also say CDA, California Dental Association, has also had a lot of great documents, like their respiratory protection plan and program is like, and you can download it straight from their website. So if there's anybody that's still needing to get that program kind of 
up and going. going. That's a good document. And, you know, the one thing that I, because there's going to be students listening to this, there's going to be some new grads, maybe some faculty, and definitely some practicing clinicians out there listening. And, you know, the one thing that it's very interesting that we are living in a time that we'll be looked back on, like we'll look at history and be like, that was the deciding moment when we really started to pay attention to airborne pathogens like we do bloodborne pathogens. Would you guys agree that we're kind of in it? Yes. Yes. Completely. Yeah. And the interesting thing, I just gave a presentation recently on risk management and I noticed on some of my slides and I, I mix, I kind of, every time I give a presentation, I update my slides. But then I, when you talk about it, you're like, I need to change that to bloodborne and airborne. I need to change that. Even though the next slide talks about airborne, putting them on the same slide together, I think is going to be one thing as a lecturer, I need to kick it in the butt. And I, I just feel like we are in this paradigm shift because it's been required by OSHA for us to get our bloodborne pathogen, you know, uh, CE every year or every license period. And yeah, we've always had these airborne pathogens, like here's our TB, but no one really has TB, like you know, measles, but we haven't really had a lot of breakout. And so it's kind of like, we didn't really give it the justice. And we, I certainly didn't use high volume evacuation at all until mm, two, two and a half years ago as a clinician. Yeah. I yeah. did not give airborne um, pathogens the respect that they deserve in a lot of ways. And I was 100%, I've said this multiple times, but I did not know the level mask I was wearing for a long time. And I reused my mask. I, I did all the things wrong. But I will tell you, if you were like, do you also do that with gloves? Don't you wash? I would have been like, oh my God, like I would never not do all those other things. And for me, I can say from a, in, from a teaching and a professional clinician standpoint, man, my eyes are open. I, I think this paradigm shift is, we're going to be able to look back on it in 10 years, 12 years. And when people are like, oh, you remember when we didn't wear respirators for this? And we're like, yeah, I did that for the first part of my career. Like people do when they're like, I used to, you know, no gloves, get in people's mouths. And we're like, oh God, Ew. I would die. <laughs> I think we're going to be better for this. I, I agree. think that Things like this happen in the history of the world to help us improve. And I love talking to people who went through the bloodborne pathogen changes in dentistry. And I worked for a man who graduated before that was even a thing. And he'd be like, ah, we just need, I remember just cringing anytime he would take, like, I'm just like, are you kidding me? That's absolutely disgusting. So I'm excited for the day that in 10 years, they're going to be like, you are what? And you allowed that to be where? One of my colleagues, um, she was doing a dental humanitarian trip and she was taking some pictures of her colleagues there. And she took a picture of someone next to a window and the light was just right. And she like was mortified when she saw the aerosol plume, the plume. just mm. up in the clinician's face and she she's like that's the first time I really was disgusted at the fact that we didn't have anything protecting ourselves so one thing I think we're going to recognize and recognize quickly is the difference between the times that we didn't have a shield and now that we do have a shield I would love to hear stories about what people find on their shield at the end of the day. <laughs> Holy Jesus. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> so I do want to touch on something that Jessica just said. Um, I had compliance day with my students on Friday. And on compliance day, we just kind of meet up and, and we do um, CPR training, bloodborne pathogen training, HIPAA, all of that in one day. So it's like an eight hour day packed with compliance. I had told the students, I said, we need to start thinking about this as a good situation because out of everything horrible, there comes something good. So let's acknowledge the fact that, first of all, our patients understand why we wear masks. And let's understand, uh, acknowledge the fact that they understand why they need to wash their hands. So the health literacy that has come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, I just want to give props to COVID for that. We have, yeah. to, we have to give COVID something because it just sucks, right? And so yeah. if we if we give COVID nothing else, thank you, COVID, for <laughs> knowing how to wash their hands. Yes. The global <laughs> health literacy. 
because before people were sneezing on each other, they were rubbing their hands on doorknobs and railings. And, and now people understand why you really shouldn't do that. So good for you, COVID. Good for you. I remember well, Michelle, you saying once that you were in the airport and you were like, if anything, I'm so grateful now that I watched people wash their hands and it's so much better than it used to be <laughs> ever, ever. My, I've only traveled and flown one time since March, which is insane because we've all been road warriors for many a years. And I was like, I have never in my life seen people actually wash their hands. Like, you know, not just a, a squirt, a rinse and go. Like they were like getting into them cuticles. And I was like, Jesus, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you, COVID. <laughs> yes, thank you, COVID. And, you know, I, the other thing that I would like to bring up is that I'm really excited that we are finally looking at the hierarchy of controls and really looking at the engineering controls and really understanding that. Our, because for me, I'll, I'll say it, and I think all of us were doing this. We gave we asked our PPE to carry a burden that it was never meant to carry. Like we, we said, protect us from all of it. And we weren't using our high volumes. We weren't uh, having the right technique. We weren't uh, eliminating and screening patients before they came in. We've had, I mean, a lot of us have complained for many a years. Like, can the front office not say, yes, come on in, they wear a mask when they say we are homesick? Like, no problem. Come on in. The, the team wears a mask. Now, now we're, we're talking about elimination. We're talking about substituting if that person has the flu and they are coming in for a filling or something. Maybe we talk silver diamine fluoride. Maybe we talk alternatives. We talk hand scaling of that as spot and then just bring them back for the bulk of the appointment. We're talking air quality. We're talking face shields. We're, we're talking um, work practice controls and holding each other accountable. So if I do leave the room, y'all are like, Hey, Michelle, you want a little pump of that Germex would be real great. I'm like, oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> Just yeah, got, and I completely in my head, agree. think about it. I wish that I could go back now and be like, you remember that patient that you said could come in with a huge herpetic lesion? Remember that? And herpes <laughs> is a virus. Hey, guess what's smaller? COVID. You know, like, you know, like, I wish I could go back and be like, but, you know, hindsight's 2020. And I'm just thankful now that that we're recognizing, like you say, this need to pre-screen patients and, and that it's not okay to let somebody in and aerosolize their yuck. It's not okay. Yeah. Hindsight I, will definitely be 2020. This year is going to be the year that we look back at and go, oh, that's why we do this. And that's why we changed that. And I hope that we look back in our hindsight with 2020 and Take it seriously. Give the respect to the things that we face with every day and give respect to the limitations of our PPE and really practice more ethically as we move forward. That's the one thing I didn't realize how bad things were outside of the college until I started getting some of the replies that I was getting from 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 folks. I need to be really careful. I don't say students because I don't, want, you know, you never want to offend an office because you don't know what you know until you know it. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And I didn't realize the degree to which people were not understanding the CDC recommendations. And it's really easy to turn a blind eye. Like Michelle said, you, you didn't know your mask level. Why didn't you know it? Just because you just didn't pay attention to it. And so a lot of offices during the day-to-day -day grind, they just weren't paying attention to updates. And now all of that came raining down on them at once. And I don't know if, if maybe this is just what it's going to take to fix it. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to definitely see the needle move in the world of infection prevention and infection control and compliance. Hopefully, hopefully for, for the love, please. I hope for the love of all things clean and sterile. Let's hope that it <laughs> I was just thinking like for anyone who's listening to this, it, this is an invitation for you to try a little harder to be a little better. I have colleagues that have lost jobs because they were holding themselves to a standard that wasn't being met by their, their employer. And I hope as a team globally, nationally, that we take this opportunity to step it up and really, that, yeah. really show what we can do with what, what the guidelines are. 
it really breaks my heart though when I hear things like that because in my like you said before in your hygiene heart in my hygiene heart like I've talked to to folks like that like you're talking about that lost their job because they want to uphold this this higher standard and you get to thinking like yes it, if that ultimately was not the office for them but what about the patients in that office like yes you lost your job and yes you have to move on and find a different job but like it, when you talk to folks like that, that's that's their concern. They step back and say, yes, I lost my job. But what about my patients that are there? I know I'm not there. I know I have to find a different job. But those folks are still there. And those folks mm -hmm. are still getting that level of care. And why should you be ashamed or feel offended for wanting the best for your patients? And that's when I step back and say, yeah, I get the business of dentistry. Amen. Uh, trust me, as, as department chair right now and spending the money I'm spending and knowing my budget can't handle that, I see it. I understand what's involved in owning a practice and the costs and all of that stuff. But then I also see what about the patients. And so when I talk to clinicians like that, their concern isn't, yeah, they're concerned about their family, their financial wellness and everything, but they always go back to the patients in the practice. I'm curious if you have any suggestions, recommendations, advice to if a student graduates and does go into a practice that maybe is sub par are not meeting the just basic not even we're not even talking best practices of infection prevention but just the standard do you have any suggestions on like how did they bring that up how do they approach it when did they say i can't do this because i think we all have that that exact feeling emily of like but my patients and i'm sure any hygienists that have been practicing long enough have i've experienced it i've stayed in practices that were not healthy way longer than I needed to because I was like, if I don't stay with my ethics, who <laughs> these poor Bayesians are left to their ethics. So well, but that's also not my, healthy for me. I told my students on Friday that they're going to be the most marketable class when they graduate the class of 2021. I truly believe they're going to be the most marketable class because look what they've gone through. They learn things one way, then they had a complete shift. Now they're learning things another way. Then when they get into private practice, they're going to see who, who got on the wagon of COVID compliance and who didn't. And a lot of the offices, I think, are going to be looking to these students coming out of school. And they're going to say, what do we need to change? You've seen what the school has done, not saying everything the school does is right or wrong. But I said, you're going to be so marketable. I'm so excited for you because I don't really even think it has to do with happiness. Like some people, when you read the Facebook forums, oh, I'm so unhappy with my office. They're not compliant. I think maybe we need to not look at happiness and look more at safety. Like, yeah, you're not happy with that position, but why are you not happy? Is it because it's not safe or you're not making the money you want to make? And so then you have to make a decision ethically, like maybe this, this practice you're working, you're getting treated very, very well, but you're not meeting the safety expectations. So ethically, what, what do you want to choose? And that's what I tell people from an ethics standpoint, having that crucial conversation. So maybe you say to your boss, Hey, can I just talk to you for 10 minutes after work tonight? I just have a few questions. And they say, well, what do you want to talk about? Well, I just have a couple questions about some of the things we're doing for infection control and I just want some clarity. And if somebody won't even give you 10 minutes of their time to have a discussion about the safety of the patients, then you have to step back and say, ethically, is this somewhere where I want to be? Mm -hmm. Because they won't even allow the door to the conversation. That would be a hard no to me. Then if you have the conversation and they're like, well, this and this and that and that, and then you have to decide, well, Am I going to be happy with these improvements that they're willing to give me or am I not happy and then I have to leave? But you have to draw the line in the sand where, where you want that line to be. And that line is different for everyone. So true. Jessica, any advice? I think start small <laughs> in the sense of you go in an office and you're like, oh my gosh, all of these things need to be changed in order to be compliant. And starting small starts with you. For example, for myself, I, I mean, I've worked in lots of different offices and some more compliant than others, but my compliance was al always the same. So is there something that you can bring to the office to have you be more compliant? Are you going to be buying your own face shield? I mean, that is the employer's responsibility, but that might not be a fight you want to have. And But you can provide certain things for yourself and implement those as a way of example, not a way of, you now we, 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 let's not get into the hygiene diva. I know more than everybody else. I'm the best, blah, blah, blah. 
No, it's, it's, it's just having your own personal standard and doing the best you can with what you have. And sometimes what you have is things that you bring yourself, especially if you are in a, an attempting situation, you have your own temp kit. You have all the things that you like to use and you bring from office to office, add your own masks, your own gowns, the things that you want to implement for you and the patients you're seeing to be safe. This doesn't have to be an overhaul. It's going to be one little step at a time. And that step is by example. Oh, so good. I think in a temping situation, it's almost easier. Yes. Because you can say, oh, this is just how I work. I'm responsible as a temp. You know, I, I carry my own liability insurance. I'm responsible for how I do things. I need to make sure I protect myself and my patients regardless where I'm going. When I've heard hygienists who email me or students who come to me with concern, it's always like, I have to be in this office for four weeks, Mrs. Bogey. What am I going to do? Or yeah. like, I need this job to feed my kids. I'm a single yes. mom. What do I do? Then that's when you say, you know, you have to care for yourself as you care for yourself. But I completely agree. Ultimately, as a hygienist, you have to say it's my it's my responsibility to myself and my patients that I have the correct PPE. And if you're looked upon, we just had this conversation just when we were, uh, I don't know, when we were talking in a, in a group last weekend, we were talking about one hygienist who just, she wanted to stick to her CDC protocol and no one in the office wanted to. And she just stepped up and said, I'm not trying to be a diva here, but I'm of the age group where I need to be concerned about contracting this illness. I need to protect myself and my family. So I'm going to do it this way. And I'm sorry if you don't agree. And so in terms of not using the ultrasonic, the other hygienists are not doing full polish on everyone. The other hygienists are not wearing laser a respirator. Plume. Right. Laser plume. Not, not are using people laser. lasering right now. Oh yeah. yeah. Holy. No, this is Holy a conversation we oh had last weekend at a meeting we were at. I'm not even kidding. I guess the Iowa way to say it is to have the balls, to have the balls, to step up and be like, which I know is not PC and it's not, you know, <laughs> sorry. I'm not known that. for being PC on this well, I'm just saying, I put that in the universe. Have the self-efficacy of being like, I need to do this for myself and my family. And if someone you're working for doesn't understand that, and if your coworkers don't understand that, in my opinion, I wouldn't want to be there. I wouldn't want to work with people who don't respect that. And I understand that people are, you know, between a rock and a hard place that I don't want to be here, but I have to be here. I have bills to pay. I have things to do. And this, I, I want people to know that I empathize and we as a, as a profession empathize with those situations. And it's all about, well, what can you do now to make your situation better than it was yesterday? What can you do now? And I think people forget that even if you work in an office and the office has malpractice insurance. You as a provider need your own insurance. You need to be protecting yourself. You have a license. It doesn't matter if the practice has malpractice insurance. You yourself need to be, oh, please, please. <laughs> Unless your name is physically on the yes. policy. I tell the students, if you don't ask to see that policy, see your name on the policy, you better get your happy butt into some malpractice insurance. Yes. Oh, I mean, I've advice. worked at places... I've been worked at places that um, my employer said, I have malpractice insurance, you're covered. And to Emily's credit, don't think that that's, yes, I'm covered. Make sure your name is on the policy. And if it's not, get your own. You have taken an oath. You have taken an oath as a provider to take care of your patients. And so you're between a rock and a hard place. And we're, we understand. So just do a little better. If you're wearing a level one mask, upgrade to a three. If you can't get that, do what you can. Double mask. Do like do what you can with where you're at. I mean, that's a very rudimentary example and I hope nobody's in that situation. But I would like just a little better every day. Well, and I had somebody get a little sassy with me about us wearing double masks. And I'm like, no, first of all, it's a respirator and we're, we're caring for the respirator with the second mask. Yes. Secondly, it is not discrimination against the patient if you're double masking on every single patient. Somebody's saying that the, was discrimination? I mean, that's I literally the, in the well, guidelines right now. Isn't that discriminating if you treat people with, with double masks or double gloves? I'm like, no, because we're doing it for every patient. Across the board. And I think the person who sent me that email 
they were perhaps one that practiced in the AIDS HIV response generation of dental hygiene, where people would double glove when someone had noted that they tested positive. And so I have to give them grace for that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But but what I don't have to give them grace for is is giving me grief for saying that we were using a respirator with an overmask because that wasn't the intent. It wasn't like we, oh my gosh, they have COVID. No, if they have COVID, we're not going to see them in the first place. Right. We're not going to treat them in the first place. So like step back before, before you judge. And that is the one thing I also wanted to say with this whole thing, you know, liability insurance and, and all that discussion with, you know, I, I lecture on ethics. That's, that's no secret, but not jumping on each other. It's easy to jump on somebody when you don't understand. And it comes from a place of fear. I truly believe that. So when you're not understanding what another practitioner is doing, then you can ask. Like, it's really easy. It's like, just can you help me understand why, you know, your practice is wearing level one masks and and still using the high speed? Well, that's all we can get. Okay, I see that. Is there anything the college can do to help you get better PPE? Or can I help you with that at all? And not coming from screening protocols. Right. Not coming from a place of judgment, but coming from a place of interprofessional collaboration and support. And it, it's really easy to sound snarky or come across snarky. And if I always tell people, if I come across that way, or if I come across as not being kind, you have to, you have to tell me because there's only one way to fix it. But I also understand that not everybody has a personality. So yeah, I've been blamed for that a few times in my career, but Again, not with great intention. And, you know, I just, I so appreciate this conversation with you ladies this morning. I think you guys gave amazing advice. There's just one last thing I would love your um, thoughts on. And this is around the idea of, you know, we've all done this, probably, I know I have, coming to work or coming to clinic sick, not just with COVID, but with the sinus infection, a cold, uh, the you know, someone in your house is sick. And I personally believe, yeah, it's an American way, right? Like we get guilted by people um, in the office or in the clinic because they're going to have to pull the, our weight for us or whatever that looks like. However, that needs to change. And I, my personal opinion, my strong personal opinions that that needs to change. And I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts or advice or even things that might go against what I'm thinking. I do have thoughts. (laughs) Um, It's the American way, but also it's hygiene school way. I remember in hygiene school, I went to clinic with a scratched cornea because the fear of everything, I was so afraid to miss anything in school because I was going to let someone down, not be able to make it up, not have the information, fail boards, not get a job, not be able to pay for food and then die. Like it all (laughs) all, all culminated into this big thing. And I think especially in hygiene school, there's this culture of you do not miss you stick those cotton rolls up your nose and let your snot dribble on that you do you you do not miss and I think that's the one of the biggest changes in programs for hygiene school is there is way more options for you when you're ill for example we have hybrid courses if you're not able to come to physical class you're going to be able to engage online there have the things that have come out of this pandemic is going to change hygiene school for the better and that spread of any type of illness any type of illness so if you are ill i'm telling you all students i know you're scared to miss a day when you are sick stay home and you will have the opportunity to work with your program director to get things taken care of without you being miserable at school and also without infecting patients or those around you. So I think that's been one really great thing from policy is that you have options when you're ill. Yeah, we had to change our attendance policy this semester too because because of that. Anybody who knows me personally knows if if I am not dead, I will be (laughs) at work because I love to work. And sometimes those of us who have that extreme work ethic that's just ingrained in us. We, we do things that aren't necessarily in, in our best interests or in the best interests of those around us. So to, to put that caveat out there, 
I just want to be the devil's advocate to what Jess just said. I'm all about work ethic and I'm all about balance. But I think that if we don't promote that, that culture, when especially at the beginning of the year with some of these students, they don't show up to class and they don't show up to clinic and they don't take it seriously. And then they don't meet their compliances and, and then they don't graduate. Um, and so there's always this dichotomy of students, right? You have the students who are like, I don't want to say like me, but that incredible work ethic driven, oh my gosh, there's always going to be a patient in my chair. I'm going to come to school. I'm going to put the cotton rolls up my nose because I'm going to succeed. Then you have the other students on the other end of the spectrum that say, oh, you know, my back kind of hurts today. I just don't think I can go to clinic. And maybe in week 10, when they have like two patients and they, the, the rest of the class has 10 patients done, then they come to you and they say, oh my God, Mrs. Bogey, what am I going to do? There's no way I'm going to pass. And I have to say, well, that's because you've missed this many hours. And so we're always balancing that. And while I agree that hygiene school does put the fear of everything into you, I still say, you know, I'm almost through with my doctorate. And the hardest thing I've ever done is my two years of dental hygiene school. Amen. I, I hear yes. you. I would rather do anything than go back through dental hygiene school. And I, yes. I don't know if it's like PTSD or what, but it's a thing. I, it's true. I would, because nothing was as scary as not knowing if your chair was full, not knowing if you were going to make clinic hours, not knowing if you had a board's patient that qualified. There's so many variables that are completely outside your control. And we all know that. But there's some of these students that were not raised by my mother. They were not raised with that work ethic. They were not raised with the polite nature to call people if we're going to be late. They were not raised with the polite nature not to fall asleep in class. And the accountability isn't there. And so while I completely agree with what Jess just said, we have to, unfortunately, instill this in folks that were not taught that already. You still have to do everything that is required. There are just now more options. When I was in school, I, I couldn't get online. Right. I didn't have a I didn't have a Canvas course. I didn't have other options. So with what Emily's saying, as a student, all of you students who are listening to this, this is a program with a rigor that you may not have experienced before, and it will require of you things that you didn't know you had, but you have them. But one of those things that it cannot require of you is for you to come with a communicable disease for you to share around with your buddies. So please understand that that's the line. The line is not, oh, my back kind of hurts. Oh, I didn't sleep well. Oh, I went out drinking with my buddies. I should probably, you know, I, I didn't the weekend. So I just kind of feel sluggish. Now there's fit for duty. Don't come drunk. I'm not saying that, but you, you've, got to, you've got to be, you've got to be able, and this is, maybe this is a great screening tool, Emily. Like, You've got to be able to show a level of professionalism with these decisions in order for you to be a successful professional as a dental hygienist. The kind of professional I want to work with, the kind of professional that I want to be cleaning my teeth and educating me on what I need to be doing to take care of my overall health. So maybe maybe this is a time that we're going to be able to reevaluate some of these things and still maintain that level of professionalism. And you I know always, that level of you know, I, I always tell the students, you know, back when I was in school, and I, I'm sure they're so sick of hearing that. But I think a lot of times I'm just trying to remind them how fortunate they are. Back when I was in school, we didn't have Canvas. We had to wait two weeks to get our clinical grades back. We didn't have Talaval. We didn't have faculty that sat with us at the end of the day and told us our strengths and weaknesses from the day and looked at our self-evaluation. And it's not that those faculty were bad because you know what? Those faculty still work with me. It's that they didn't have the tools. And so how fortunate are you to have the tools, have the faculty with the tools and have these advancements? And so I'm always constantly reminding of the, them of that. And students who are listening, it's not because I'm a hag that's old, which you might think I am because maybe I am. It's because I want to remind you of how fortunate you are to be able to be like, yeah, I think I might've been exposed to COVID. I'm just going to go ahead and stay and take lecture from home and ask my instructor questions via email because I can or request a Zoom meeting because I can. 
No, these are, this is a fantastic conversation. I'm just so grateful for you ladies because you're both bringing up excellent points. And I think as much as I understand Jessica's point and also your point, like the Grady or the pendulum swing is wide with work ethic for sure, right? And so we really do have to think about like, is this communicable? Is this contagious? You know, am I going to create harm by coming into the clinic and spread it? Because I think we've all probably worked in a practice where you get the one person and then you just spread it through the office, right? One person comes in coughing and sneezing and it's like, well, let's take bets. How many days do you think until I get this? Because that's just what happens. And that is, I think, even though we're not dying from the cold, I still think that's egregious. It should not happen. And, but it's not a backache. It's not a hangover. (laughs) And the wine flu is a real thing. I get it, guys. Like I've experienced it a few too many times myself, but it does not keep you from, I think you're right. Like you are going to learn how to become a professional and really figure out when is it going to create harm and when do I need to get my shit together? Right. And maybe that is, that's what we're trying to teach students. And we have such a hard time with it because everybody's at a different place. So if you treat everybody in the class, like that's the whole difference between equity and equality. I'm always talking about that equity versus equality. You can't treat them all equally because they weren't all raised by my mother. You can't treat them all like they know what diversity is because they weren't all raised by my mother who maybe didn't have all the tools for teaching me what diversity was because she didn't have the experiences. And so you have to meet people where they are. And sometimes students will say, well, Mrs. Bogey is just, she just wants us to to work so hard. And she has, um, I was once told I had unattainable expectations. And I'm like, no, it's not that I'm trying to ask things of you that you can't do. It's me asking things of you that I know you can do that you think you can't do. Yep. Just because you think that you're maybe weak or or tired or whatever. No, I know you're tired, but you power through it. And sometimes that's part of life. And some of these students don't quite understand that. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to be in their best interests. And that doesn't always come across that way, unfortunately. Piggybacking off of that, I would just like to invite everyone who's listening to stay on your own page. And what I mean by this with this equitable versus equal, oftentimes a student will say, well, you did that for that person. Well, this happened there. And I, and, and oftentimes you don't know as the outsider looking in the situation. Now, yes, we, we want to treat everybody equitably, but sometimes that doesn't look equal. And so when something happens in clinic, that was a, a, one patient provider situation and you think that should be applied to the masses, it often shouldn't. So remember as a, as a person, make sure that you are staying on your own side of the street and taking that into consideration and really having the trust and the faith. I hope, I hope and pray you all can have the trust and the faith in your faculty that they have your best interests at heart and will do everything they can to make you the best professional that they can help you with like that's right and I I think that that trust is sometimes I don't know how to get that from students and I try at like our compliance day and I try at the welcome events and everything to to build that very early on but that's so hard because not every patient is the same not every student is the same and then you'll get the well you just like her better that's why you gave her a comp on that And it's like, no, I gave her a comp on that because I tried to take that calculus off and I couldn't get it off. And I've been stealing dang teeth for 20 years. Right. And it's like, they don't understand. Well, why did she get a competency for that? Because that rigor was so much higher. And I, and I think back to when I was a student and when you're going through all that, it's really hard to process that stay in your own lane mentality because there's so much going on and it's the one thing that you can complain about that might be justified, right? And That's, you're like, yeah. I need something to complain about. Let's complain about this because it might be justified. And so <laughs> I, I try to give students the grace with that, but it's so hard. I, I hear what I hear you, Jessica. I hear you. It is. And and it's one of those, it's one of those things of hygiene school. And I I mean. I think maybe as a student, remember that your instructors were once students. Like we remember what that was like. 
And we are working every day to make your experience better than the, the experience that you had yesterday. I Maybe mean, I should give Michelle that picture of me in hygiene school that I showed you a couple weeks ago, Jessica. You should. And I, and I added this slide, Michelle, just to catch you up on what I'm talking about. I added this slide in my ethics presentation where I talk about um, prejudging students based on your biases, where I put up pictures of students and talk about, they're not actual pictures of my students, but they're pictures that look like my students. And I talk about biases. And then I put up my picture of me in hygiene school to see about the biases that people have. And then I put up my picture now so they know that that picture they just looked at, because it doesn't look like me, the picture that I put up. So it's me. a very different Emily. It's a I, whole I need to absolutely see this. This is a hundred percent what I need. I need to see it. ASAP. And people are like, oh, she's this, she's that. It's like, no, she's me. That's me now. Just because I was that way 21 years ago doesn't mean that I'm that way now. I mean, part of me kind of is that way now. <laughs> But it's all these, these biases. And I know I'm taking this infection control conversation off the rails into ethics, but as educators- They're, They are very close. I, they cross-pollinate. Yeah. <laughs> they cross-pollinate for sure. Yeah. No, this was such a, such a good conversation. The one thing I just want to piggyback off of what you guys said is, and I hope the students understand, is that as faculty member, even though I'm not actively a faculty member at this moment in my career, I- I think you we want to be. I have, I have some work for you if you, uh, girl. You know, I'd help you any day, anytime, any place. I would be happy. And You'd I do have to move to Iowa. That 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 part might you say be that like it's punishment. I mean, this is God's country, right? <laughs> is this heaven? No, no, no. It's Iowa. Out of board in Iowa, unless I throw it on some like cornfields or something. Aren't you still but, single? We got some nice men here. I'm just saying. This is true. This is true. Um, there you go, Michelle. Maybe like that's that what we're missing. Yeah, that's that's, what, Maybe that's what we need to do, Jessica. But I do want to piggyback off of that because, you know, I've personally worked with some faculty members that have said, like, I graduated with this, you'll graduate with this. And, you know, things are different. Our struggles are different. And if you are a faculty member listening, you really do have to remember that there are these biases and you should grow and change, even though we did go through that. And I did have to wait six weeks to get my, you know, license, like my clinical, I'm sorry, my written uh, grade. And I'm having like anxiety attacks on every night before I go to bed, if I'm going to get it, like things have changed. And it, as much as we can hold them up to a standard that is within our hygiene profession, we have to adapt, we have to grow. And I think you guys brought up so many great points about being a student in a program and everyone that's listening, um, especially the students, I hope you realize how hard a lot of your faculty members are working to make sure you're safe and you're taught to the highest standard so that you can go out there and make a change and make a difference. And if you do graduate and go into an office that is not practicing that way, that you are able to navigate what to do, how to make those changes, how to make those choices and deciding if you need to say goodbye or if you could be the change you want to see in that practice. And, you know, I have, you two are so amazing. I appreciate your time today, your, your advice, this conversation, because it makes me even open my eyes to some things. And I'm just so grateful for you guys to be in our profession. Thank you. You're welcome. And I have a question for you, Michelle. Um, is there any way that we can help you to get these out to students, these podcasts? Um, or is there a way yeah. that we can um, we can set up something on our Canvas sites to link students to podcasts easier? Because I know I have um, I have the students linked to a Tale of Two Hygienists through we have a program Canvas page, and so I feel like a good idea. there's so many people in the profession that the students um, can look up to, especially through podcasts and through blogs yes. and yes. through some of this free continuing education that's going on. And the students just soak it up like a sponge because you're not their faculty. And, when <laughs> yep. things, and to some faculty, that can be scary. And they say, oh, we don't want anyone who's not us talking to them. And I look at that as if they can get one more perspective from you as a brilliant mind in our profession. A trusted resource. Right. Like if you can hear Michelle Strange talk, she's so smart. And I tell my students things like if you reach out to this person, they like, I am not the most intelligent person in the world, but I'll be darned if I don't have the smartest friends in the world. Yeah, like, so true. Like yes. this is a video that 
Jessica Atkins had made with Hygiene Edge, and they are the cat's pajamas. And so you need to watch this. Okay. And so showing that mutual respect among the profession, that's the type of behavior and ethical building I think we need to do as educators. So anything we can do to get this this message yes. out there, please Thank you. reach out. It's all about that growth. It's all about that growth. Thank you. And I will definitely uh, give you some suggestions for sure. And if you are a student, please share this with your your cohort. Like let them know that this this was a topic that we talked about and um, you know, I will say I got to give students so much credit these days. And I say this to Andrew all the time when we get, you know, amazing comments from students like in our um, direct messages or on our ratings and reviews. I don't know if I would have had the bandwidth to think about listening to a podcast during hygiene school. I, I just don't. I mean, maybe maybe yeah. because this is the norm and they're so used to taking in so much information right now because that's just who they are this is how they well, grew my up. nokia 5120 in 2001 could not handle podcasts no. <laughs> it could barely like t123 text so the <laughs> capability these students just i mean some That's of them amazing. are driving an hour one way to school yeah and so just to be able to listen to you for me to give them the access to you would be huge well thank Emily, you one and thing one thing that our program's done is because they have a requirement to go to how many ces during their tenure at our university. We've been discussing how we would open up that they would maybe listen to a podcast and write a little a little response or a summary. Or, and the idea was we want them to go to these continuing education events to connect to something bigger and broader than the, the cohort. You can get so tunnel visioned in school and you can feel so just focused to craziness and to understand that you are part of a community that's beyond whether or not you have a patient in your chair, sometimes is the lifeblood to what you need to remember is that you are going to be entering a profession that really is full of these brilliant minds that will support you and help you and inspire you. And you do that, Michelle. And sometimes I, I can't do that. So the Emily Bogey they see in the classroom is Mrs. Bogey. They don't see this side of this podcasting, just sh sitting around shooting the breeze with my buddies, talking to Michelle Strange and Jessica Atkinson. They see Mrs. Bogey that has to write policy and procedure and Mrs. Bogey that has to give them a midterm reminder of their grade being below a C. And so having someone that is spreading a message that's both positive and in compliance with regulation and ethics and infection control, that isn't me. I mean, they get awful sick of me. <laughs> well, you know, I do want to also just give a shout out to both of you. Um, Jessica is a part of Hygiene Edge. That Their YouTube channel is something that I have used for years. And I'm like starstruck when I got to meet you guys. I was so <laughs> grateful. So definitely check out Hygiene Edge and also follow them on social media. Emily has given some courses and CEs that have just changed who I am as a professional and I'm so grateful for them. So if you have the opportunity to take any of those courses or watch something that Hygiene Edge puts out there, I mean, jump on it faster than you, I mean, than slap, slapping a mosquito. I don't even know, like my country analogy there, like just jump on it super fast. Um, you guys are such amazing people in our profession. I'm just so grateful for you. And I know that you are so busy. So thank you for taking this time on a Sunday morning, early morning for you, Jessica and Emily. I'm we're all in different time zones right now. This was just amazing. I'm so grateful for you guys. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure too. This is this is good therapy for my heart too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We hope you guys enjoyed this round table. Thank you to our guest for bringing all their advice and their research that they found for us. And again, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. You can always go to our website, attila2hygienist.com. We would love your feedback. And don't forget to share this episode and rate and review us on any of your listening apps. Thanks, everyone. Bye, y'all.